Luma Lecture. Today's guest uh, is Katja de Stum from Bonn. So I'm very glad that Professor Stum invited our invitation, uh, I'm sorry, accepted our invitation. So let me say a few words before his um, lecture. Uh, Professor Sturm got his uh, PhD in habilitation at the University of uh, Lange Nuremberg, and then, after um, so among other uh, stops, he was in, in Zurich and in Leipzig. Uh, since 1997, he has been professor at the University of Bonn in Germany, um, and well, right before uh, uh, moving to Bonn, uh, he had started uh, developing a. Um, very uh, far-reaching and um, groundbreaking theory, um, geometric theory of metric measure spaces. In particular, he's uh, um, this very uh, important for following um, analytical research. Um, the notion of synthetic, so synthetic notion of curvature, he was introducing those years. And um, ever since his research has been on the boundary between um, stochastic analysis and geometry, I would say, but uh, we will see in a few minutes, um, of course. Um, let me mention that between 2016 and 22, um, he has uh, received a New C advanced grant for uh, research on uh, metric measure spaces. And he has also been a managing director of the uh, Hausdorff Center of Mathematics uh, in, in Bonn uh, in the last decade. Uh, nowadays, is also a member of the Academia Europea and of the Academia Lincei in Italy. So um, I'm very uh, curious to listen about uh, Professor Sturm's talk on metric measure spaces and synthetic Ritchie bounds. So please, Professor Sturm, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to this prestigious uh, lecture series and also for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, my topic today is uh, metric measure spaces and synthetic Ritchie bounds. It's a kind of broad overview. Um, I try to touch different uh, aspects, uh, some more geometric aspects. Uh, there might be something a little bit more towards data space, uh, then there's a probabilistic aspect, and, and also, of course, analytic aspect. Uh, there are almost no technical details. Only for the very last part, if time permits, I have included now a little bit more explicit uh, definitions and, and estimates. So I would expect that some of you are interested in trading as in groups, uh, things like that. And um, this, has, this will pop up at the, at the very last part, provided time uh, permits me to, to uh, present this. Before I come to metric measure space and synthetic Ritchie bounds, I will very quickly uh, talk a little bit on metric spaces and sectional bounds, sectional furniture bounds, because this concept is uh, much uh, better understood uh, since uh, many, many years. Okay, nowadays I think both concepts are well understood, but for many decades, uh, Ritchie curvature was not that well understood. But sectional curvature was uh, well understood, and there was a perfect generalization towards metric spaces. So metric spaces, uh, of course, you can regard them as generalization of Banach spaces, whatever. But uh, my perspective is that we should think of them as generalizations of the many manifolds, the distance just measuring the geodesic distance on such a space, uh, and the concept of, of metric spaces allows uh, also to uh, treat surfaces which have singularities, which allow branching and so on, uh, fractal-like structures and so on. Uh, and it was Alexander already in the mid of the last century who uh, proposed the curvature concept for metric spaces just by comparison triangles or angles. So essentially the message is a section of curvature has to do with the evolution of distances under the exponential map. And you will see that Ritchie curvature has to do with the evolution of volume elements under the exponential map. Um, and so distances are the, the crucial uh, ingredient in the definition of uh, Alexander uh, curvature bounds. We have curvature bounds from below and from above. And uh, it made um, 
the whole thing uh, much more interesting when it uh, was combined with a notion of distance introduced by Gromov, the gromov hauser distance on the space of, let's say, compact metric spaces. And uh, these two concepts fit together in a perfect way. Namely, if you look on, on the equivalence class of all metric spaces with a section curvature bounded from below by a, a number k, then this is closed under common force of conversions. Uh, you should here consider equivalence classes of isometric metric spaces, but uh, allow me to be a little bit sloppy here. So you have closeness of this curvature amount under the uh, right notion of convergence. And even more fascinating, you also have a compactness statement, namely all metric measure, all metric spaces, which satisfies a, a lower curvature bound, an upper bound on dimension, and an upper bound of the diameter. This class is compact. I'm sorry, can, can I ask a small question? Sure. Since at the beginning, uh, uh, can you give us some hint what is this Grom of Hausdorff convergence? Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you know what is Hausdorff convergence? Uh, the Hausdorff distance between two sets in, let's say, Euclidean space or in a metric space? Uh, yeah, approximately, yes. Yes. And then Grom of Hausdorff simply means if you have two metric spaces, uh, you try to find another metric space in which you can embed these spaces, measure the Hausdorff distance in this ambient space, and minimize it over all embeddings. Yeah, so the, it's the smallest Hausdorff distance okay, in, thank you. in which both spaces can be uh, embedded isometrically. Yeah, so if, if let's say you have this metric space and this metric space, you try to embed them into one metric space, and then it's a problem of house, uh, the house of distance in this embedded space. Uh, yeah, but this is, this is in some sense, there are also very, very uh, other definitions. You can choose an epsilon covering of the set, so, so just a finite number of points, such that the epsilon ball of these uh, points cover everything, and then it's just the uh, uh, distance between a pairing of these points, the maximum distance which you have if you minimize overall embeddings and epsilons, blah, blah, and so forth. Okay. Uh, and for this, Alexander space is many geometric uh, results uh, can be uh, done. In some sense, um, the idea is that everything which which uh, is proven in remaining geometry and, and which depends on sectional curvature bounds and not on smoothness should also hold for Alexander spaces. But now we are here in a seminar on analysis. And for analysis, it's not section curvature which plays the, the crucial role. It is Ritchie curvature. What is Ritchie curvature? Ritchie curvature is the trace of sectional curvature. So Ritchie curvature in one direction is the sum over all the sectional curvature where the second vector is orthogonal to the first one. Now, so given one direction vi, you have n minus one, which are orthogonal to it. And sectional curvature, essentially means it's determined by, it's the curvature of a plane. Uh, a section curvature needs two ve vectors, and you have two tangent vectors, you measure the section curvature in this tangent vector, and then you fix one vector, the second one for the section curvature, and then the second vector uh, is uh, run. And since Ritchie curvature is essentially the trace, or the, you could also say mean value of a section curvature, um, Every bound on sectional curvature implies a bound on Ritchie curvature, but not other way, not far from very large. And uh, so, and Ritchie curvature is very much related to the Laplacian. Yeah? Sectional curvature is related to the Hessian of something. If you make uh, comparison results, you can say under sectional curvature, you have a comparison result for the Hessian of a distance square or Hessian of a distance function, if you like. Uh, under Ritchie curvature, you have uh, comparison results for the Laplacian. And okay, mostly you try to avoid the Hessian. You try to work with the Laplacian. And wherever Laplacian plays a role, it is Ritchie curvature, which is uh, crucial. And from my personal interpretation, it was uh, very much uh, STL who realized that many, many results, if not most results, uh, or almost all results, uh, in, in geometric analysis, 
depend on lower bounds on rigid curvature and nothing else. So let's say in, in results in the 60s, they have been proven on a number of, of assumptions, bounded geometry, bounds on curvature from above and below and so on. And then in, in the 70s, it became clear that uh, for more or less all these results, you only need a lower bound for the rigid curvature. Never an upper bound for the rigid curvature. And mostly you can avoid bounds on section curvature. Bounds on section curvature quite often are used to put hands on, on truncation function, mollifier, and so on. But if you work hard enough, you get rid of that. And uh, also in, in probabilistic approaches, it was Elworthy, Malira, uh, who identified the role of a Ritchie curvature. Um, and of course, later on, also Perlman with respect to flow, uh, Poincare conjecture, and so forth. And it was again Kromov who, who had this uh, famous uh, pre compactness result, uh, generalizing the result which I have mentioned right before. Namely, if a family of three many manifolds now with rigid curvature bounded from below, bounded dimension and bounded diameter is relatively compact. Now, so for each triple of K, N, and L, you have a relatively compact class, which means if you start with a um, sequence of smooth manifolds, which model your universe or your quantum fields or whatever, you can be sure that there is an accumulation point. Not necessarily a manifold, this is now the point, but uh, yeah, there is something. And the question was, what is this something? And Chica and Colding uh, started a, a very uh, detailed analysis of these limit spaces, so-called richer limits. Um, so I, I only have put here two years. Uh, there have been three huge papers by them, but 20 other important papers by other people uh, going on until today. But you people study limits of remaining manifolds with this uh, bounds on uh, curvature, rigid curvature dimension and diameter. Uh, and okay, in the case of section curvature, we knew what, what the limit uh, objects are in the metric spaces, uh, and vice versa. Each metric space, in some sense, can, can be seen as uh, something like a manifold. In under this weaker assumption of bounded rigid curvature, lower bounded rigid curvature, this was not so clear. Uh, what Gromov already uh, pointed out that the right object is uh, a triple consisting of a space, a distance function. Yeah, metric, uh, but metric is used in, in quite many different contexts uh, and a measure. So uh, now if we want to understand rigid curvature, it's not enough to have just uh, space and distance. We need space, distance, and measure. And for measure, you could think of this is needed to, to build some trace. And the aim is uh, we want if for we want to define a lower Richie curvature bound for such a triple XTM. We want to give a meaning what, what should uh, be the, the meaning of Richie of this triple larger than K. And this should be equivalent of a classical uh, remaining definition if we have a smooth manifold. It should be stable under an appropriate notion of convergence, which is a kind of extension of Gromov Hausdorff convergence. Actually, the standard notion is called measured Gromov Hausdorff convergence. And very naively, if it says you have form of house of convergence and on this sequence of uh, metric spaces, if you embed them into the right limit space, the measures are weakly converging. This is not exactly the correct definition, but it, it's almost a definition. And the next definition, uh, the next requirement is uh, such a definition of which curvature bound should be intrinsic or synthetic. Not as in the case of rigid limits that you say, okay, I have a sequence of manifolds uh, which converges to something. Uh, it should be intrinsic as in the Alexander uh, case. In Alexander case, you can say if I have a metric space, I choose a triangle, I look on distances and angles. If this inequality is satisfied, then this is a, a space of non-negative curvature. Or if in Sobolev space, uh, you, you say a function is in, in uh, so well, let's space H1, if this in fact holds true, and you do not always have to refer to a sequences of the infinity functions with this in fact properties. You want to, to uh, 
consider physics as an object by itself. And of course, all these definitions only make sense if you are able to deduce uh, interesting geometric, analytic, spectral theoretic uh, results. Uh, the definition is justified by the results which can be proven into setting. And um, yeah, the basis of, of my today's talk is from uh, this definition of synthetic lower Ritchie bounds, which was proposed by myself and uh, simultaneously by uh, John Lott and Cedric Villani. Uh, so a definition of Ritchie curvature bounded from below combined with a bound on the dimension from above. Uh, based on the concept of optimal transport and everything relied on, on uh, important works uh, which started in, at the end of the last century, Grenier, Grenier Gangbo, McCann, Otto, Otto Villani, Cotero, McCann, Schmuckenschläger, myself and von uh, So it's really based on, on uh, very important conclusions which I cannot uh, explain today. Um, let me come to the basic setting. Uh, what is uh, this optimal transport which we use? Uh, probably you all know this, I do it very quickly. If we have a metric space, let's say complete in several metric, we define the space P2 as the space of all probability measures which have second moments, final second moments, in the sense that the distance square functions in the general. And we define the Kantorovich Wasserstein distance uh, two uh, by the minimum or infimum of, uh, of this um, L2 norm of a distance with respect to a measure on the product space. And the measure on the product space should have a properties that if projections to each of the coordinates gives them a uh, given margin. Yeah, you have. Uh, you look on measures on product space, uh, we call them couplings, such that uh, their one-dimensional distributions are the different measures mu and mu. Um, let me simply give an example. So if this is my measure mu, and this is my measure nu, the product measure, for instance, is a coupling. Now, if I take the product measure, if I project it to the x-axis, this is my measure mu. If I project it to the y-axis, it's for measure nu. And but product measure always is a coupling, but it's mostly uh, quite useless coupling because we want to minimize the distance. So we ask for a coupling which is as close to the diagonal as possible. And in this particular example, uh, the measure which I have uh, displayed here is also a coupling. And you see this measure of course is, is much closer to the diagonal. So this distance square function uh, is, is much smaller here as there. So the optimal coupling is uh, this. And indeed, it turns out, uh, this is the result of Grenier, that the optimal coupling in this uh, remaining or Euclidean setting is always sitting on the graph of a function. So the optimal coupling is always sitting on a very low dimensional space. It's never for that function. If, if you do not start with Dirac's masses and so on. So whenever you have an absolutely continuous uh, measure uh, in, in one coordinate, then the uh, optimal coupling is a, is a graph. Uh, what can you say in, in more abstract terms? You can say that this uh, space P2, this Wasserstein space, Kantonovich Wasserstein space, equipped with this uh, Wasserstein distance, is a complete separable metric space, or so as good as the original metric space was. And if your original space indeed is an Alexandrov space, then this is also an Alexandrov space. This is quite nice. We don't use it, but this has to do with the fact that uh, these Alexandrov curvature conditions are conditions in terms of distance squared, kind of triangle inequalities for distance squared. And since we integrate distance squared, this original inequality carries over to the same inequality for for Alexander's thing. So I give you here a very non-precise but intuitive uh, definition of Alexander's space of non-negative curvature. It says that if you have a right triangle in this space, then you have Pythagorean inequality. Right? On a sphere, if you make a right triangle, a triangle with a right angle, then the side opposite of this right angle is smaller than you would expect. 
the C square is smaller than you would expect. And this is positive curvature. And this is the way how sectional curvature enters the picture. It always uh, is a comparison of distances, more precisely of distance squared. And, but as I mentioned, our, our business is not sectional curvature, but rigid curvature. What is rigid curvature? Rigid curvature is perturbation of volume elements. And the property which we identified is uh, related with the Boltzmann entropy. Now we look on the Boltzmann entropy, sometimes denoted by S or entropy with respect to M. So we have a metric measure space. With this metric measure space, we have a reference measure M. And then we can consider this S as a function on the space P2 or P or all probability measures on our, on our metric space or manifold or whatever. It's for Boltzmann entropy with a plus in front, the physicists would have a minus, uh, just to remind you. And now if you think of a positively curved space like the sphere, you make the following observation. If you have a probability distribution here and another pair, and if you look for the optimal transport, this other style stuff, then the midpoint looks like that. Yeah, because you transport mass from here to there along geodesics and by the positive curvature on this sphere, the midpoints have more space. Uh, just make your great circles yourself on, on your uh, football at home. Uh, you see that the space of midpoints uh, is larger than the space of endpoints. And if you start here with the equilibrium distribution on a given ball, the same here, then if you take the equilibrium distribution here, uh, you have a, a smaller entropy. Now, if you have more space, the entropy is smaller because it can spread out more. We have a, a plus in front, the more the mass can spread out, the smaller is the entropy. So your entropy looks like this function, so you have convexity. And it's even more precise, the convexity is even, is the more, the more curvature you have on your underlying space. And we say the underlying space is curvature larger than K if our entropy is K convex in the sense of uh, usual convexity along uh, on, on real line. K convex along geodesics. Now, on, on an abstract metric space, we say a function is K convex if on this space it is K convex along each geodesic, parameterized by arc length, which means this geodesic, then the correction term has the length of this geodesic as a quadratic uh, prefactor. But this k half t one minus t is just the term which you see if you integrate uh, out the usual inequality second derivative larger than k. Okay, so this definition uses the two ingredients which we have on our space, namely the distance. The distance enters the picture by uh, saying what is a geodesic, and also here for this correction term. And the measure enters the picture by defining what is the entropy. Now, these two ingredients a priori are independent. You can choose on, let's say, on your sphere, whatever measure you want. You can start with a fractal like measure, and you can try to check this, and you will realize that this holds to for almost no measure. Uh, it requires that measures and distances really play uh, together in a very, very sophisticated way. But a priori, the definition says, given any distance function, any measure, uh, this triple has non negative rigid curvature if this function is convex. It has curvature larger than K if it's K convex. So this is our definition of curvature without any constraint on the dimension. And uh, with a dimension, it looks a little bit more ugly. So let's first introduce what it says if there's a dimension bound and the curvature bound is zero. Then instead of a Boltzmann entropy, we look uh, on the convexity for the Rayleigh entropy. And now Rayleigh entropy means instead of a logarithm, we take here the uh, negative uh, root of a density. Now uh, it's rho to the one minus one over n. It's uh, related also to the porous medium equation. If you look on fracking flows, for that, this is porous medium equation, but this is another story. Uh, 
why is this an interesting function? This is interesting because this end fruit produces uh, distances. So let me let me go to a single simple example. If you have here a, a cube, and if you calculate the Rayleigh entropy for this cube, the density then is just uh, one over the volume. One over the volume, the rho and uh, the m cancels. One rho with the m cancels to give one. What remains is a rho to the one to the minus one over n, which is uh, the volume to the one over n. So in this explicit example, if it says we have non additive Ricci curvature if the end fruit of a volume element is concave. This is not the definition. So this would be the definition if, let's say, Somebody from Romanian geometry could have a dream of what, what is uh, a nice world. You would say, okay, uh, non negative Ricci curvature would say that the volume end fruit is concave, whereas non negative section curvature means that the distance is concave if you evolve this along two geodesics emanating from the same point. And you also see here that for such a cube, uh, the volume, of course, is the product of the side lengths. And if you differentiate uh, the product, you end up with sums. So the differential of a product is the sum of the differentials. So you get the sum of these of this differentials, which are the section curvatures. So uh, the perturbation here has to do with the sum of the perturbation, which appears there. So which is the sum of uh, section curvature. This is behind the whole story. Uh, but this is just a little bit a uh, heuristic and explanation why, at the end of the day, we understand uh, that this definition is a good definition. Uh, first of all, it's a good definition because this definition is stable. I will come to that, and it allows to prove many properties. And uh, before I go on, I have to combine now curvature and dimension. And this is where, for instance, uh, Lot and Villani already failed uh, uh, because this when is a quite ugly business. Uh, we still have this kind of rainy entropy, but now we have uh, complicated coefficients, no longer t and one minus t, but we have these coefficients which are known from many geometry from Bishop Gromov uh, result. It's a mixture of n minus one dimensions, where n is just a fractional number, perhaps. Uh, feel for curvature in one dimension doesn't feel for curvature. So the idea is in transport direction, you don't feel curvature. In orthogonal direction, you have this curvature and this uh, gives you this coefficient. And so this is a coefficient uh, which replaces the standard convexity coefficients t and one minus t. And with this kind of convexity of a Rayleigh entropy, we define the curvature dimension condition. Um, I don't think that uh, this is now uh, possible to understand this if you have not seen it before, uh, but it reduces to the cases which you have seen before. So in the case n to infinity, this does not converge to rho t. If you uh, do it in a clever way, if you attract a little bit and divide by something, this gives you a rho times log rho, and you end up with a Boltzmann uh, entropy. And of course, for k equals zero, this is just one minus two. What is important is that this condition is satisfied for our remaining manifolds, if and only if on this manifold we have Ricci curvature bounded from below by k and dimension bounded above by n. It also holds for weighted remaining manifolds. It holds for the so called Ricci limit spaces in the Chiga Colding theory. It holds for Alexander spaces. Which intuitively should be clear, but it was uh, it took about ten years to prove that Alexander space is satisfied this synthetic Ricci curvature bound. Even if naively Ricci is just for trace or, or yeah, trace of, of section curvature, but the approach was uh, very different. Uh, Alexander geometry is a purely geometric approach. This is much more an analytic approach. It holds for thin spaces. If you modify a little bit the uh, definitions, if you read the assumptions, it also holds for the Wiener space with Ricci curvature one. It holds for configuration spaces and so on. And the important thing is out of these spaces, you can build new spaces by passing to limits, by building products, cones, 
suspensions, warp products. So there is a, a huge uh, building uh, block uh, which allows uh, to construct new spaces out of a given one. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, what are the important geometric properties for these spaces? Um, the first one is uh, for the so-called Bonnie Myers diamond bound. Namely, if you have a positive K, positive Ritchie bound in a finite dimension, uh, if a diameter of your space is bounded and then it turns out that the space is compact. So uh, bound is sharp. And okay, this is only possible if we have these complicated distortion coefficients. We have a bishop Cromer volume comparison result, namely, if you if you fix a point, if you look on spheres around its point of radius small r and capital R, uh, then the volume of a small sphere is uh, bounded from below by the volume of a large sphere times this ratio, which comes from the model spaces. Model spaces are spheres or hyperbolic spaces. And the proof is rather easy. Because what you do is the following, you have a fixed point at the center where you put a, a Dirac. You have a large sphere where you put a uniform distribution. And then you make your optimal transport between the large sphere and the center. The midpoint has to be exactly on the small sphere or the intermediate point. And uh, if a uh, really entropy is convex, it means that uh, you have to have enough space. And enough space means that the sphere is large. Then your remaining calculation would, would give you. So this is, in some sense, just a two-line argument. What is interesting is that uh, in this context, uh, also popped up a new bishop of volume growth estimate without dimension bound, uh, which, had no, which was not known before. So the volume of balls under which curvature bound is always can, can uh, not go faster than uh, each of the R squared times a constant. And actually, this growth can be attained. Uh, but if you have a, a dimension bound, it's a square root of R. Uh, it's each of the R times something. Here we have each of the R squared. So this is a kind of infinite dimensional case. Uh, maybe I skip Levi Gromov. I just want to mention this was open for more than 10 years and only proven uh, recently by Cavaletti and Montino, but I don't want to explain it. Those who know Levi Gromov uh, as an inequality for message is it is proven now also in this uh, singular spaces. Uh, what is more fundamental is uh, that this curvature dimension condition is stable under convergence. And now there might be the, the next uh, appropriate question, what is convergence? I will give a brief definition uh, uh, what we mean with convergence. The naive definition would be the so-called measured form of house stuff, which I also did not define so far. Uh, obviously, I give a definition of this on the next slide. Uh, and more importantly, now we have a compactness result. So Gromov had the pre-compactness because he only knew the setting of uh, Riemannian manifolds. He could prove that this class, if the X is a manifold, is pre-compact. And now we know that uh, the space of metric measure space, which has the bounds uh, for the uh, Ritchie curvature and the dimension, and the diameter, this is compact. In particular, it means if you start with a sequence of such manifolds, uh, you always have a limit in this space. So all the Ritchie limits of Chigger holding uh, fall into this class. Uh, and now a uh, very brief uh, definition to this transportation distance, which we use. So as I mentioned, you could take the measured form of house of distance, but I prefer this transportation distance dp. And um, yeah, just take p equal two, not making it more complicated. Uh, how do we define this? So we have two metric measure spaces, and now we do roughly the same what uh, Gromov did with, uh, with uh, uh, house of distance, but a little bit more, let's say, better adapted to our situation. We look for 
uh, two couplings. We look for a coupling of a distance, uh, which means this is a metric on the disjoint union of these two spaces. Or you also could say we isometrically embed our two spaces into into uh, ambient space. And then we have this, this coupling of a distance. And then we have a coupling of the meshes, which this is what we already know. And this coupling of the meshes tells us uh, which point of my space X naught should be transported to the point of a transport uh, X1. And now the coupling of a distance gives us a distance from here to there. Up here of a distance T naught is only here, the distance T1 is only there. But I, I want to bring these two distances into a bigger space such that I also have a distance which measures distance from here to there. And if you play around a little bit, then uh, it turns out, okay, you think, okay, I can bring these pieces to, uh, as close as uh, possible as ever, but there's almost no distance, but you cannot make this zero to zero in general. And uh, so infimizing over this D and M, you get the transportation speed. This is a very natural uh, concept. I have on this slide several other uh, information on this distance, which I will skip uh, just uh, because I want to also to, to focus on other things. What was also important is that curvature dimension condition is a local property, even if it's defined globally, right? because our curvature dimension is now defined by saying, whenever I have a mass here and a mass there, I find a geodesic and along this geodesic the entropy is convex. This is a global condition. Curvature in Riemannian geometry is a local condition. And one of the strengths of Riemannian geometry is local to global. Yeah? You have information only uh, on, on small scales, and you can deduce information on large scales. This was possible to prove in the beginning only in these cases uh, where the distortion coefficients are trivial, namely curvature zero or dimension infinite. I had some work with Bacher where we did that and, and it took uh, more than 10 years, 15 years, but Kavalei Milman finally proved that we have a local to global property. So this was a quite, quite demanding uh, open question for many, many years and it relies on a very sophisticated technique called localization technique developed or based on needle decomposition of Tonata. Um, maybe you also know about stochastic localization, a very hot topic uh, right now. This is all in the same circle of, of techniques. Um, but curvature dimension now is, is known to be, to have a local to global property, which is very important. And <clears throat> now more interesting for most of you probably is uh, what can we do not only from geometric uh, aspect, but what can we do if we want to do analysis of this space? And uh, yeah, the message is we always have a heat equation on these spaces. Uh, if you have this triple, there is a heat equation. And uh, actually, you could think there are two heat equations. Namely, the classical heat equation you would define as the gradient flow of the energy on L2 spaces. And how do we find energy? This also is something which has been clarified within the last decade, namely, uh, you have a well-defined nice energy on every metric measure space, uh, well-defined in the following way. You simply take the local Lipschitz constant squared and integrate it. But of course, this is not a lower semi-continuous function. Or in, in operator language, it is the corresponding operator is not closed. Uh, what do you do? If something is not lower semi-continuous, you take the lower semi-continuous relaxation. No, you just make it lower than the it's by brutal force. Uh, this is the so-called relaxation in, in calculus of variations. So you make for relaxation, and this is what, what we call uh, now energy or chica energy. And it turns out, uh, this is by the work of uh, Abuso Chile in summary, that this relaxation also coincides with the energy defined as the minimal weak upper gradient in the sense of a Finnish school of analysis going back to alphas and, and these people, uh, Hanon and Koskela. So we have a well-defined, point-wise defined uh, gradient and uh, energy, which is lower semi-continuous. 
there is another approach to heat equation going back to Felix Otto. Then he proved that on Euclidean space and many folks, uh, actually he proved it only on, on Euclidean space, that the heat equation or weighted Euclidean space, that the heat equation is the gradient flow of a Boltzmann entropy in uh, Wasserstein space. Now the heat equation regarded as a as an evolution of measures, let's say, or if you if you grow the functions, I, I I'm a little bit sloppy with the notation. I say entropy of a function is this object, uh, and again uh, we now know that uh, in full generality, in some sense, these two approaches coincide. Full generality means whenever this function here is uh, semi-convex. And only for semi-convex functions, you have a reasonable concept of uh, gradient flows. Now you need semi-convexity in order to give a good meaning to this object. In the case that this is semi-convex, this is our curvature dimension condition. Both approaches coincide, namely this approach where heat equation is a flow of measures and where heat equation is a flow of functions in L2 space coincide. It goes back to uh, work of Jordan Kinderlehr Otto on manifolds, then on many uh, on, on Euclidean space actually only, uh, then it was has been extended to many manifolds, Kinsler spaces, Alexander spaces. There are some cases where it's highly non trivial. For instance, on Heisenberg group, it's true, even if there is no curvature dimension condition. Ah, and uh, this is similar to recent work on metric graphs by Alba, Falkert, Mars, Monoro where we also don't have a curvature dimension condition. No curvature dimension condition can hold true on metric graphs and on Heisenberg groups. Nevertheless, the heat equation is the gradient flow of the, of the entropy. There are some extended cases like Wiener space, uh, configuration space, where you have to modify a little bit from the definition. There are cases where you have, where you have to modify the def definition significantly, namely discrete spaces and uh, Levy semigroups. Um, because then, yeah, you have a really different uh, distance here on, on, on your space of probability measures. And there's a work by uh, Angela Profeto and myself for the Jurich Laplacian, where you also have to modify the concept. Uh, you go to so called signed particles, and uh, then you can prove it also for the Jurich Laplacian. But let's say in all these cases, it's, it's anyway covered by Ambrosio Chili Sava, and in many other cases, this kind of meta theorem uh, was proven. And what uh, we have been interested in had been the analytic versions of this, uh, of this Ritchie curvature bounds. And in a sloppy notation, we can say if this Ritchie curvature bound uh, can be written as uh, the inequality of that Hessian minus one over n writing s squared is larger than k. This is the so-called kn convexity of a Boltzmann entropy on Wasserstein space. So this should be regarded as an inequality on Wasserstein space. And uh, this is the so-called Lagrangian approach where you think of transport, of, of uh, geodesics and so on. And then face of an Eulerian approach where you think of particles, uh, heat equations, and PDEs. And the uh, Eulerian approach is an abstract version of a so-called Bochner inequality. The abstract form uh, was formulated by Baku and Emery even 30 years before Lot and Villani uh, and myself even uh, thought of, of the word curvature dimension. And they define curvature dimension in, in the following way. And such an inequality is meaningful on every metric mesh space. It's not always true, but it's meaningful to check whether this is true because you have a gradient and you have a Laplacian. Since you have the heat equation, you have a Laplacian and you find a weak formulation of this. Uh, this is, it should be clear to everyone. You put here a test function phi, you put the Laplacian of, on the test function and then already this term is well defined. And, and the same you do with all the others. Just put a test function and uh, make a uh, weak formulation when this is, is meaningful. The shorthand notation of Barclay is gamma two. This is this uh, commutation of Laplacian and gradient. This is the left-hand side, larger than k times gamma one. Gamma one is the gradient u square plus one over n times the generator squared. And 
it's known since many years that the Buckley Emery is equivalent to a gradient estimate. Just forget these terms where n is involved. It's a complicated. Gradient is less than gradient of the heat flow is less, less than heat flow of a gradient. This is the short term message. And uh, here, the symbol message is the Wasserstein distance. After letting these meshes flow, is smaller than the Wasserstein distance of the initial. If you ignore all these k's and n's, for k equals zero, n equal infinity, it simply says Wasserstein distance is non x1 under the heat flow. And this is equivalent to rigid curvature bar. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I should say this is the simple definition of synthetic rigid bound for probabilists or analytic, uh, yeah, let's say probabilists. Uh, if you have two probability measures, if you define the heat equation after time t, they have a distance which is uh, not larger than this one. If this is true, then and only then you have non negative rigid curvature. This is a definition of non negative rigid curvature without using tensors and so on, without any kind of differentiability, any geodesics and so on. It's just what's the time distance of heat flow at time two and at time t. And this is what we use for rigid flow. Okay, now what can we do uh, on the analytic side? Uh, there is a whole slew of results, uh, more or less all these results, which had been proven by Li Yao and uh, Brian Davies, Krikio Yan, and, and many others, can now be carried over to metric measure space. The most classical one is the spectral gap estimate, namely if you have a positive curvature, and the spectral gap is bounded by the k times n divided by minus one. On many faults, this is the celebrated Lichner rod inequality, um, but we have more general results, as I mentioned, Laplace comparison results, Bochner inequality, Liao, differential inequality, Gaussian estimates, and so on. These are typically the so called finite dimensional objects or results, they are infinite dimensional uh, uh, results. The counterpart here is Loxovolev inequality, Talakra inequality, Van Hanak inequality, or Lequeux inequality, and uh, <coughs> some uh, yeah, more deep results uh, are kind of reverse than the previous result. Uh, the starting point is the so-called splitting theorem. Oh, I forgot to mention. Did I introduce the RCD somewhere? No. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I had it written there, but I did not say. From now on, I assume that my metric massive space is infinitesimal Hilbertian, which means that the energy, or which by definition means that the energy is quadratic or for, for Laplacian, it's linear. Uh, this is not always the case. It is not really a surprise because it, you can just put an, a Banach norm on your, on your R2 and uh, do the same game with Lebesgue measure, then the metric measure space, you can define the energy, but the energy has the dual norm of a given norm to, to measure length of gradient. And if you make Euler Lagrange equation for that, you see that you differentiate the, the norm squared for some very strange norm, and it's never a linear operator which comes out there. Or it's only a linear operator if you start with Hilbert. Whenever your norm is not Hilbertian, the operator is not linear, which comes out by Euler Lagrange equation. And but you still have a heat equation. And, and it was also a surprise to me that some of his uh, results of Brian Davis are also true for a heat equation in nonlinear settings. Yeah, we have, for instance, integrated Gaussian estimates, surprisingly. Uh, this has nothing to do with the linearity of the operator. It's just that we have a kind of second order operator, which is used there. And from now on, I always assume that my operator is linear. And if, so this is this R in, in, in front, uh, which, which comes from Riemannian, but, but this is really a singular space. And now, um, yeah, but maybe I should split, uh, uh, skip that. So if there are a lot of structural results, this I do not want. I want to go a little bit to, to uh, extended settings uh, and, and uh, evolutions uh, in, in the last time. 
So uh, one direction is heat flow and optimal transport on time-dependent metric measure space. And uh, <clears throat> this has to do that we have a, a powerful and a robust theory of super rich flows. I will come right now with a definition. Uh, and <clears throat> yeah, let me directly go with this. So if we have a one parameter family of measuring measure space, now we, we want to go, we want to establish the link with the work of Perelman. Now, how, how is this synthetic lower Ritchie bound related to the uh, famous words of uh, Perelman concerning Ritchie flow? Uh, and the bridge is established by work of, of Topping and McCann. And uh, then also there's uh, um, some interesting insight by uh, the Kopf and myself. So think of a, a one parameter family of metric measure space and to simplify everything, we model it on the same space. So we have just one parameter family of distance functions and measures, and we assume a certain regular dependence on uh, T dependence. I do not want to quantify it here. Um, what we uh, realized then is that this picture from Otto with a gradient flow of energy and gradient flow of entropy now uh, has a interesting um, different uh, interpretation. Namely, if you look on the gradient flow for the giga energy, this is the forward heat, heat flow. Yeah? We, we have time goes in this direction. We have at each time slice, we have an energy. And first of all, of course, it's not really clear what is a gradient flow for a time dependent function. We can give a meaning to that. It's a time dependent function in a time dependent geometry. So this is of course a little bit trickier. So it's like skiing on, on a avalanche. Yeah? Your underground is changing and so on, and, and your function is changing. But we can give a meaning to that. And then heat equation we define as a gradient flow in four directions, so going uh, upwards in my in my interpretation. And now this is on functions and dual to this equation on functions, there's an evolution on measures, which goes backward in time, just by duality. And backward in time, you can then study the gradient flow of an entropy, again, time dependent functional in a time dependent space. Backward in time, you consider the gradient flow of entropy, and this is indeed the dual to the, to the gradient flow uh, for the energy. So you have the Two heat equations, heat equation functions, and heat equations on, on measures, dual to each other. Uh, so we have again this identification, but we have to really uh, take into account the different time direction, which is very natural if finally one has understood that. Um, and it's quite fascinating. And we say in remaining geometry that uh, we have a, a Ricci flow, if a, a Ricci tensor. Um, if, or let's say, if a time derivative of a metric tensor is given by the Ricci at time t, and we say that we have a super Ricci flow if there is an inequality. Yeah, if this is like harmonic and superharmonic solution, subsolution to, to PDEs. But of course, if there is no time dependence, uh, super Ricci flow means uh, non negative Ricci curvature. Now, every non negatively curved space is a super Ricci flow if it's static. And now the, the synthetic definition is, uh, of course, it's not surprising that it's complicated. What, what do you have to check? At each time slice, you look on optimal transports and you have the entropy. And now instead of a convexity, uh, we use a different definition of, of convexity. Namely, we say uh, this function, which should be convex as a function of this, of this curve parameter, uh, that the slope at the beginning, is less than the slope at the end. This is another definition of, of convexity. But we don't want to have zero here, we want to have something different here, namely that the change of a metric. And the change of a metric now is the change of a Russell statistic. So this is then the synthetic definition of super Ritchie flow. Of course, this is now two parts to really understand, but there is such a definition. And with such a definition, you can carry over our functional inequalities to the time-dependent setting. You have this definition of super-rich flow, 
you have this definition in terms of an optimal transport. This simply says, if you start here at time t with two meshes, you make the flow, the evolution of meshes goes down, downward in time. And then at any later or, or go down in, uh, backward in time. So at any earlier time, this uh, distance is smaller than the original. Now you start there, you let the uh, dual heat flow uh, evolve these things and you are not contracted. This is the definition of severity. You can do the same in terms of uh, brown motions. Brown motions also go back in time because these are in some sense the pathwise versions of this distribution. And again, going back in time means that the distance is not uh, increasing. Pathwise, this is a very sophisticated uh, property that uh, you can start to paths and uh, which never increase the distance. Gradient estimate, gamma two estimate, everything is as, as we expect. Uh, so, yeah, then there are thousands of other inequalities uh, which you can prove. And, um, yeah, okay, uh, maybe I should not then go into that much more detail. Uh, if one wants to go in more, uh, in deeper understanding of, of rigid law, one needs upper rigid bounds. This is a sophisticated complicated issue. We still do not have a very good understanding. Upper rigid bounds are much more intricate, uh, much less stable. Uh, we have some partial results, uh, but also these I don't want to uh, mention. I mentioned one of its uh, later results. Uh, what, what are we doing right now? We study variable rigid bounds. So instead of such a gradient estimate, if instead of a constant, we now have a function, we end up with such a uh, bound where this is a Schrödinger operator with potential k or feynman katzin group with potential k. So for rigid, the lower rigid bound plays the role of a, of a potential in such a Schrödinger operator. This can be extended, but k is not only a smooth function, but a function, let's say, in part of class. It also can be extended that the k is replaced by a measure or even a distribution. The most similar setting right now is a distribution, top left space w minus one. And such a, a distribution pops up if you have Neumann bounding condition with non convex bounding. The non convexity of a boundary, uh, yeah, the, the <clears throat> curvature in the interior is just k times the volume. And on the boundary, it's the second fundamental form times the surface, surface measure. Surface measure is, of course, singular with respect to the given measure. And L, if it's negative, you really have a singular distribution, which is in this space, but which is, which is not a function. It's a, really a signed measure. OK, this I should uh, skip. Uh, and uh, let me. Okay. This is, actually, this was what I had hoped that I can explain to you in more detail. But uh, yeah, this is now my very last slide. So I had mentioned a little bit time dependent, second order distribution value. There is a lot of interesting work uh, on discrete spaces uh, initiated by, by Jan Maas and uh, uh, Milke uh, with, with a lot of uh, current work, which uh, gives new insight on random walks and graphs. Uh, there is, of course, dual to that the traditional uh, calculus on, on graphs, which also allows to develop a gamma calculus, a la Barthi Emery. But here, it's uh, the interpretation is towards gradient flows of entropy in a modified distance. This also has application to uh, non commutative calculus. Uh, there's work by Eric Hahn, Jan Maas, David Townshaw, and Bird. There is a funny extension of this curvature dimension conditions uh, with negative parameter, uh, which has no geometric meaning, but uh, it has a functional analytic meaning. Namely, if you expect that your equilibrium measure is not decaying like e to the minus r squared, but e to the minus r, then uh, you should ask for a curvature dimension with negative. 
And uh, as I mentioned, there is also work towards sterically boundary conditions, which has to do with coupling of mesh of mesh spaces. And then I should stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, good force uh, among uh, different topics in uh, optimal transport and synthetic geometry. Um, I think it is time for questions and comments. So uh, I'm sorry, can, can I have a naive question? Uh, can you give uh, some kind of motivation for this entropy that you used to define the... Uh, the Boltzmann entropy you meant? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so let's say, um, okay, what should, what should one say? Uh, I think the easiest explanation is we use it because it works. Uh, the next more deeper explanation is we, we use it or it, it, it seems to be very good because um, the gradient flow for the entropy is the heat equation. And mm -hmm. I guess we all uh, believe that the heat equation is the most important evolution on, on uh, natural spaces or, or on uh, manifolds. And let's say for, for these finite dimensional objects for these function inequalities, at the end of the day, of course, we try to avoid the heat equation. We use more of a Boltzmann entropy. But this is very, this is a very, uh, not the Boltzmann Ferrini type entropy, but this is a very unpleasant object uh, in some sense. So um, with uh, Ferrini type entropy, if you make one of some of these, yeah, here we have this, this Ferrini type entropy. Um, This ring type entropy um, corresponds to, or the gradient flow corresponding to this is, is uh, the fast diffusion equation, which is a nonlinear PD. And um, this is much harder. So uh, I we just realized that also in this case, it is actually easier to for, formulate this curvature dimension condition in a different way. So this is historically the first definition where how everything started. But nowadays I would formulate it more as the KN convexity of a Boltzmann entropy. Uh, and this was in some sense an advantage which Erba, Kuvada and I, myself had when we wanted to prove the equivalence between Eulerian and Lagrangian uh, formulation. We used this KN convexity of Boltzmann entropy, we work with a Boltzmann entropy, whereas Ambrosio, uh, Savary, and uh, Mondino used the Rene entropy and they really got lost. Uh, they are extremely strong, I, I, I would say, but they needed five years more than, than we uh, in order to finish this uh, calculation with a Rene type, because then you have commutators, you have to control these things. Uh, with nonlinear equations, if you have a lot of error chance, uh, things are, so, yeah, you need chain rules and so on, and, and things get uh, really complicated. But um, intuitively, I cannot really give you a very good answer. So, of course, it would be nice to have a very, very good answer from statistical physics. Um, the Boltzmann entropy is, in some sense, the infinite dimensional version of everything. And uh, to make things easier, you try to get rid of the dimensional effects. So it's easier to start with a Boltzmann uh, entropy. Therefore, it's also easier to derive a log Sobolev inequality than a Sobolev inequality. This is maybe on, on the same level. And uh, only okay. if you have additional information, you can bring the dimension into business and then you have more complicated objects. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. But you see, in your definition, this entropy can be infinite. So yeah, yeah, uh, sure. But, but but this doesn't matter. So it simply says 
yeah, like for a convex function, if left hand side is infinite, then um, the condition is already void. Yeah, if this is infinite, then okay, if this can be whatever it wants. Okay, thank you so much. Other further questions? May I ask you maybe uh, a small technical question, something uh, more general? So the technical question is the following. Um, you were mentioning the example of metric graphs among the, the uh, problematic cases because you have uh, um, curvature inbounding from below. The point is that curvature is inbounding from below in metric graphs exactly at the, at the vertices of degree larger than two. So in a certain sense, it is there are, there are singularities, but there are very few of them in a, in a, in a finite graph. Do you, can, can you see any theory take into account the sparseness, the paucity in a certain sense of the singular points? Yeah, actually, this is one of the challenges um, where I hoped to find a positive answer, but could not do so in the last five years. Uh, so from my interpretation, the curvature in, in these uh, vertices is of order h to the minus two. So uh, with this distribution valued uh, Ricci bounds, which we, which we know, we can control h to the minus one. Uh, H2 to the minus two plus minus epsilon, perhaps, in some sense seems to be the, the very absolute borderline, but so far it's, it's far beyond every calculus which has been used uh, and established. I'm not really sure whether it's possible at some day to do so, but I'm not, yeah, I don't really know. Um, it would be fascinating to, to incorporate this. And as I mentioned, I would see this as a, as a very singular negative curvature, which brings to the gradient estimate not, okay. I also can, can tell you the following, if you have a bounded curvature, your gradient estimate is of a order, of a order e to the kt. Yeah, where k is the lower rigid bound. If you have an h to the mi h minus one, curvature, then the gradient estimate is e to the square root of t for short time. And okay, in your case, you have e to the constant, e to the t to the zero. Because on, on, on these on this graphs where you have degree larger, two, larger than two, you get a, a constant which does not go to one. In the gradient estimate, an explicit number which comes from the degree. But it, it, at least it fits into this picture e to the t, e to the square root of t, e to the constant. And this has to do with, with this uh, uh, parity bound uh, of in, in, let's say, L2, h minus 1, h minus 2. But at the moment, this is just holistic, at least this last step. Okay, thank you. And my second question was related. Um, okay, I have more, but maybe you can discuss after afterwards. So maybe just concerning your very fascinating theory of uh, super rich flows on uh, uh, on on families of of metric measure spaces, time evolving metric measure spaces. So just understand correctly, you are assigning. A low for the evolution of distance and measure, right? So when you're when you're skiing on the avalanche, as we're saying, this avalanche is falling by itself. It's it's uh, you're not it's not uh, evolving according to a, a geometric PDE, right? Yeah. So in, in this definition of super rigid law, we take the evolving landscape as given, and then we study the equation. 
which is not really, uh, for, for, let's say, um, construction of Wichita. Now we take the evolution of a landscape and then we define the heat equation. And in terms of the heat equation, then we decide whether this evolving landscape was a super rigid flow or not. And next step is, this is in principle also possible, but not that elegant, doing kind of opposite inequalities. Uh, we have to, to characterize sub rigid flows. And then this also can be done with this heat equation, but it's it's much more sensitive. And then we would say if your if our landscape is a super rigid flow and a super rigid flow, then it's a rigid flow. But it's not a construction of rigid flows. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's just a characterization of rigid flows. We are far away from from uh, construction of rigid flows. We can do a little bit, but but this is not really. Uh, this, this is not beyond what is known anyway. What we can do is we can uh, apply this, for instance, to um, surfaces. And for surfaces, everything is, is then well understood because if the surfaces are richer flows in this context, they are evolving Alexander spaces, and then they. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, then, then at the end of the day, it's just a, a PDE, nonlinear PDE starting from a distributional initial data, but being smooth from uh, at every positive time. Yeah? So, so this is uh, at time zero, it can be singular, but uh, in two dimension, one has this strong uh, regularizing effect that it is smooth uh, at any positive time. In higher dimension, rigid flow. On the opposite, it can start smoothly and evolve similarly. Uh, so, but I'm not too optimistic, I must say, that we can really contribute existence with that to which it goes. Mm -hmm. This is, um, this requires much more uh, powerful techniques than we have at hand at the moment. And most results of which flows indeed are only true in dimension three. Mm -hmm. you know, even for smooth manifolds in dimension seven, people know almost nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and if we would start with a, with a metric measure space, which has dimension 25.5, okay, it uh, would be a little bit too much to expect that we can solve this problem uh, just by a simple uh, two-line argument. Uh, but uh, the characterization works well, and um, okay. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions in this official round, so to say? It is, seems not to be the case, and I would suggest we thank Professor Sturm again. But, uh, can I ask oh. another one question? Yes, <laughs> so, is you, you daily ask question about this metric, graphs. but what about? Uh, Discrete graphs. Yeah. You, you mentioned something in your talk. Yeah, yeah. With discrete graphs, um, this is in some sense um, more complicated. But, but, okay. Of course, it's not, not a problem to define the entropy. Huh? You just give uh, uh, certain weights to the vertices. You have your, your mass sitting on the vertices. Everything is fine. Uh, but then if you want to, to study the gradient flow, it turns out that um, the Wasserstein distance, if, if you just classically define it, is not a geodesic distance. Geodesic means uh, the Wasserstein distance, if you define the length of curves, uh, then every curve has length infinite, every non-trivial curve on, uh, on a discrete set. So it does not make sense to ask for gradient flows if there is no geodesic, because we want uh, or no continuous curve. Uh, and therefore, uh, Mars and others uh, introduced uh, a modified distance uh, where you define the Wasserstein distance uh, more according to the Planet 
uh, formula. And um, so it's it's um, more PDE version of a, of a definition of a Russell fine distance. Uh, it is a and, and there is a certain um, certain trick in this uh, since you have to to define the weight of um, of an edge, and the measures are sitting on the vertices. And this is um, this is a very sophisticated choice for so called logarithmic mean which is crucial to find the right weight or the right measure of edges. And uh, then they modify the, the given meaning with a Benamou Premier formula. And um, they are able to prove that uh, with this modified distance, the entropy admits a gradient flow. And this is indeed the continuous time about of the chain uh, corresponding to this graph. Um, one should say that calculating this modified Russell distance, Russell time distance, is uh, highly non-trivial. Yeah, even if you have a, a graph with four uh, vertices, it's a it's a highly non-trivial uh, exercise and, and requires numerical uh, calculation to, to get the distance between these uh, points. Uh, but from theoretical aspect, this is this is uh, very important. And it, it opens the door towards homogenization of size. So uh, you want to prove that on a, on a discrete Charles uh, uh, heat equation, also more complicated equations uh, converge to the, to the heat equation of the continuous space. The function inequalities hold true. And uh, the point is more or less all of these function inequalities, which are known from the continuous world, can carry over also to the discrete world. Uh, but each of his result is is uh, is a uh, is, uh, uh, independent theorem. Uh, it's not just a corollary of a continuous uh, result. They have to be good in fresh. And this is very different from from this uh, from this evolution on these electrical networks and these network paths. Even if, of course, both are related, but but from technical point, this is very different. And I, I should mention, okay, this, for this discrete sets, there is then also the, for these, there is the notion of rigid bounds. And, and uh, Mars, Mika, and, and all these people have, have uh, proven a number of results on uh, positive rigid bounds, for instance, to apply uh, diameter estimate, spectral gap estimate, and so forth. I, I can't repeat now exactly the, the statements, but uh, for, for a number of important uh, graphs or uh, models from statistical physics, uh, they are explicit uh, bounds. This is, of course, very important. Okay, thank you. Maybe can I also ask you a, a last question? So you were mentioning, so uh, it was very interesting to hear about this uh, um, in the version spaces. So I uh, I think it's a bit um, obscure to, to check them in the literature. So you were saying you basically start with this uh, chiga energy and then you close it up to get something which is um, self-adjoint, say. So yeah, it's not yeah close up. It's it's really a a, 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 a lowest and continuous relax, relaxation. It's a total manipulation, I must say, because so, you start with something which which looks uh, quite interesting, and then your your relaxation might be zero. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you take the classical theory energy. And you choose as a measure a fractal measure on on R two. Yes. But the relaxation is here. Mm -hmm. So it That's... it does not co it the, the difference between closure closure and and this relaxation is that um, this energy not necessarily coincides on its domain with the final result with the final object. Usually, uh, closability, uh, closure, and so on always means you have it on a certain domain, and there you know how it is. 
But even on C infinity functions, this relaxation might change it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you cannot interpret this result in terms of, uh, like, say, Friedrich's extension oh. of. Uh, okay, it is for if it's if it is lower semiconductance, then it is something like Friedrich's extension. But for, in some sense, for trick, this this machinery also applies to operators which are not closable. Okay, and this is a is this an abstract theory which was already existing before. Uh, it was already existing. So if you look in, in, in probably also if you look in this book of gamma conversions of Dalmar, so mm -hmm. ago, you probably also find this uh, because all these gamma limits are uh, at the end floors in the community. And this is in some sense the gamma limit of itself. Okay. You have one functional and you take the gamma limit of itself. And for, also with gamma limits, the trick is this might be quite strange from what you expect. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, but besides this being careful, it is a kind of, of closure indeed, yes, but, but not for closure in the, in the classical sense of functional analysis. So this I can find, for instance, in Julius articles. This kind of uh, results apply to this specific case of the Chigar energy. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is essentially in, in this joint uh, work of Ambrose Chili Savari. Okay, I see. Um, there are three papers of them, and, and they, they developed this, this uh, theory and they prove that it's the same as with the upper gradient in, in the sense of, of uh, Koskela and uh, all these other Finnish uh, people. And yeah, but for instance, if you come from Dirichlet forms, I, I have uh, done many things in Dirichlet forms. If you have a pre Dirichlet form, there is always the question of whether it's closable. Yes. And here we would take the brutal force and say, take for relaxation. Closability means that the relaxation and the function coincide on this pre domain. Yes. But if not, okay, we take a smaller one. Mm -hmm. We throw away in some sense yeah. pieces which do not fit to a reasonable function analysis. And then we construct, then, then we can construct operators, uh, uh, self adjunct operators, semi crops, and, and all this. And so I, in the last three... sorry, please go ahead. I was a little bit skeptic in the beginning because I also was trained in this question closability and so on. Uh, but but I'm, I'm entirely convinced. The only thing where I'm still uh, insisting is if people construct something, I always want them to prove that it's not zero. And in many results, it's not it's not clarified. Yeah, because this now, my yeah, this is, was my question. So did, is there a life in between? So you said if everything is well behaved, then you get something like Friedrich's extension. You might end up with something which is zero. Do you, are there any non-trivial examples where you don't get a uh, free extension, but you don't get zero either? Of course, you can combine things, uh, uh, having measures which consist of bad parts and, and, and nice parts, and the relaxation will, will uh, in some sense, Take away the bad part, mm -hmm. and then the smooth part remains. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. It's now a little bit sketchy, but but in principle, I think you something of this uh, should work. Yes. Okay. okay, I will look it up. Sounds very interesting. Okay, then I think. It's it's time to thank you for the time you took for us, yeah, and uh, I hope it it's not too late for you. You had a meeting right now. Uh, no, it's still okay. I, if you want, you talk about a private discussion. I could stay another ten minutes. Okay, I mean I think uh, most people left already, but I yes I. Okay. I so uh, maybe yeah. So just because we are, it's free discussion. So is this somehow 
related to this uh, you know 